Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a series for the fourth quarter of 2012, a series entitled Growing in Christ, and it's talking about some of the fundamental Christian beliefs. This particular lesson is lesson number 10 for December 8 of 2012, entitled The Law and the Gospel. Before we jump in and see what we can learn from this lesson about the law and the gospel, I would like to ask you to join us in bowing your heads for a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, this is a subject, as you know, that has been vigorously, very vigorously discussed down through the generations. What is the relationship between the law, the gospel, our salvation, what are we required to do? Is there certain things we have to do to be saved? Those kind of questions have disturbed and, and, and activated, energized Christian thinkers for millennia now. Help us as we think about these things and talk about them to, to get them more clear in our own minds and may we share with others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What does the Bible say about the law? The purpose of the law? Well, the Old Testament has some very nice things to say about the law. Look at Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8. The law of the Lord is perfect. It gives new strength. The commandments of the Lord are trustworthy, giving wisdom to those who lack it. The laws of the Lord are right, and those who obey them are happy. The commands of the Lord are just, that would be righteous, and give understanding to the mind. I mean, how could you argue against something that would do all those wonderful things? And remember, there's an interesting passage in Exodus 23, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Do not spread false, th these are instructions from God. Do not spread false rumors. Do not help a guilty person by giving false evidence. Do not follow the majority when they do wrong or when they give evidence that perverts justice. Do not show partiality to a poor person at his trial. If you happen to see your enemy's cow or donkey running loose, take it back to him. If his donkey has fallen up under its load, help him get the donkey to its feet again. Don't just walk off. Do not deny justice to a poor person when he appears in court. Do not make false accusations or do not, and do not put an innocent person to death, for I will condemn anyone who does such an evil thing. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe takes, pe makes people blind to what is right and ruins the cause of those who are innocent. Do not ill-treat a foreigner, for, for you know how it feels to be a foreigner because you were foreigners in Egypt. A lot of instructions there. Is that an essential part of the law? Well, it's not part of Exodus 20, verses 3 to 17. Um, well, look at some New Testament comments. 1 John 5, 3, For our love for God means that we obey His commands, and His commands are not too hard for us. So it's easy to keep the law, right? Easy and difficult. Yeah. Oh, come on now, you're, you're or speaking. Or should I say, easy and impossible. Easy and impossible, huh? Okay. So, how do we understand all of that? Hmm? What's, the, what's the question? Make it specific. Make the I just read question. to you. Let me read it again. 1 John 5, 3. For our love for God means that we obey His commands. That's right. Okay? And His commands are not too hard for us. That's right. So, therefore, it's easy to obey the law. Therefore, it's easy to obey the law. It's not too hard for us, right? Wasn't there well, like one command that the Lord gave? Or, or two. Two, which love covered, God and love your neighbors, which right? Which covers at least ten, if not more. But the, Is that easy to do? Commandments. But it just seems like he just simplified it to make it easy. Okay, well look at Romans 3, because that's a key verse when we talk about law. Now we know that everything in the law applies to those who live under the law. Do we live under the law? Well, in order to find out what happens. In order to stop all human excuses and bring the whole world under God's judgment. Who's involved? Everybody. The whole world, right? 
for no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. I thought, first John, the same author, I'm sorry, no, different author, this is Paul, that was John. I thought John said it was easy. He said, no one here, it said, no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law does is to make people know that they have sinned. How's that supposed to help? Well, how easy is it to know that we've sinned? I can point out sin's pretty easy. Well, there, there you go. It's easy. <laughs> easy, easy to point think, them out. I think the components you read out first, it's interesting that way back then we have similar needs today yeah. that often are ignored. So in that sense, it doesn't always work out like it should. Isn't the law, the, like the Ten Commandments, isn't that the character of God? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Hold on, because I want to... Well, wanna... because I was going to say, just be like God. Yeah. And how can you be like God? Is that easy? John I mean, said you think so. Well, look at these verses. Uh, the last part of the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, in Exodus 20 says, In six days I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Why did I bless the Sabbath and make it holy? Because it was done. Because of creation. Okay. Well, look at, look at Deuteronomy 5.15. Now, here's a repetition. This is Moses at the end of his life. He, he gives three major sermons in, in Deuteronomy to the children of Israel just before he leaves and ends up going to heaven, telling them, reminding them of everything that's happened on their journey and what they should have learned. So here in, in, in Deuteronomy 5, he's repeating the Ten Commandments. And here he says, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. Oh, it sounds now, like is, another piece of work. That does this said. sound like God's memory is a little faulty? No, it, it, to me it sounds like whenever God's done with something important, he, he um, makes he it... He rests, and he makes it important for us to think about it again. And he adds that to the list of why we should keep the Sabbath. I see. Okay. He created us, and he recreated or re um, redeemed, uh, re gave the Israelites their freedom. John, the one who we read from a little bit ago, has some other very interesting things to say about the law. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. If we obey God's commands, then we are sure that we know Him. If we obey God's commands, then we are sure that we know Him. Those who say that they know Him, but do not obey His commands, are liars and there is no truth in them. So what does obeying the commandments have to do with knowing God? Well, that's Demonstration obvious. Of knowing God. When you mm -hmm. obey, when you obey the law, and you know that you're obeying Him, you must know God. Okay. If you obey it's, it's, the law and you know that you're obeying them correct, you must know God. Why? Why? Can't I just make a, you know, I'll put a thing up on my wall that gives me the Ten Commandments, and I'll just follow them. I don't have to know God. No, 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 no. That you is know knowing God. If you keep the commandments, you are knowing God. But prior to, but prior to Christ's appearance on the face of the earth, they'd so manipulated and, and abused the law, they had whole tomes of do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. and still didn't know mm -hmm. God when they saw him in the flesh. Do we need an update on the Ten Commandments? There's nothing in there about TV, there's nothing in there about smoking. There's nothing even in there about driving under the influence. Or a myriad other, there's nothing in there about what you might do on the internet. Uh, don't you think that um, if you dug into all those activities you're talking about, that somehow the, the concept will end up at one of those Ten Commandments somewhere? So you think that it's important for us to understand the meaning behind it, the principle behind it. That's right. That's okay. right. And Jesus said the principle behind it is love God and love your neighbor, didn't he? 
In fact, in Romans 13, verses 8 and 10, it just says simply, love is the fulfilling of all law. So all we have to do is love. Is that easy? <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. It should be, but it quite often isn't. Well, the, the commandments is the definition of love. So you're going from something that has more to it to something smaller. You, you just said, all we have to do is love, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, no, it isn't all you have to do is love. Love has more in it than just what you, that little thing that you're talking about it has what's in the commandments. Love isn't just a four-letter word. <laughs> love is an action word. I like James 2, verse 8, where it says, uh, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, mm -hmm. you will love your neighbor yes. as yourself. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has been suggested that the law embodies the principles that we need to understand and incorporate into our lives. And if we do incorporate those principles into our lives, we, in fact, will become more like Jesus. But how do we incorporate those principles into our lives? Down through the ages, legalists have suggested that if we try hard enough to keep all of the commandments, we can be saved by keeping them. Either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, does it say that we can be saved by keeping the commandments? Well, what's the relationship between the law, the Ten Commandments will suggest, and the Gospel? Why did John choose to say in 1 John 3, 4 that keeping the commandments has something to do with true knowledge of God? Now, we already discussed that a little bit. Let, let's, let's see if we can expand our, our thinking a little bit. Would a true and correct knowledge of God be a sen an essential part of the gospel? Yes. yes. On many occasions, we have suggested that Ellen White gives us something to think about very seriously in The Great Controversy, page 555. And I would like to quote just a couple sentences from there. It is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated. What does assimilated mean? To become Absorbed. one. Become, Joined. just absorbed in. To that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. But what is it that we are supposed to behold? Well, if we're supposed to behold God and all that he has done is described through all of Scripture and all of history, is it important to understand all the things that he's asked us to do? We look and we see everything that God has done. Now, do I have to do anything? Well, what do you mean by, do I have to do anything for what? Well, the verses we read earlier seem to suggest that I have to keep the commandments, right? You have to keep the commandments. What does the word keep mean? Now, let's not get too technical here. <laughs> no, I, I think there's two meanings there. One is uh, um, when you keep it, it, it's like it's valuable to you, and so you'll keep it because it's a value to you. Okay. And the other word is that you actually perform it. Mm -hmm. So which one is it? Doesn't which it one's important? Doesn't it have to be both? Well, what point do you perform it to you, what point do you perform to you say that okay, you're good now? Okay, let me ask you this question. Has God ever asked us to to do anything which is not for our own good? No. So, intellectually, we all can sit here around this table and we hope all of you agree that everything God has asked us to do is right and honest righteous, the right thing to do. That's so, simple faith. then, we just do everything God has asked us to do. That's why we have faith in Him. Okay. Do you find that law keeping is really easy in your daily life? Well, what if we added Matthew 5 to 7 to our understanding of the law? Remember Jesus' expansion of the law in Matthew 5 to 7. You know, Hating isn't just killing your brother, it's doing all those other things. Committing adultery isn't actually performing a physical act, it's wishing to possess a woman, you see her walking down the street, whatever, all those things. Is that easy? And Jesus said, I mean, at, at the end of Matthew 5, what does he say? 
I expect every one of you to be perfect just as my Father in heaven is perfect. Simple, right? So he said, whoa, even if you think it, mm -hmm. you have done it. So even if you've called somebody a fool, mm -hmm. you've actually murdered them. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because nowadays this is what the young kids call each other. They call each other fool. It's kind of a term of endearment. Yeah. Societies twist it completely upside down. So it is said that we, have, well, we all have to be perfect, and yet Paul says that we have all come short of the law. Mm -hmm. So um, which is it? Well, here we have a real conundrum. The Bible does suggest that if we could fully keep the law, we, we, we could be saved by doing so. For example, consider the famous verses in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Just look at this. This is, this is quoted several times in the New Testament, so this has to be a key passage. It covers the whole base, right? There. Yeah. The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law, what's that? The Ten Commandments, the law of love. Okay. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. Can God do that? Wait, what does that mean? Well, what do you think it means? What do I think it means? Mm -hmm. I had a whole set of marbles once. And there was one that I liked the most. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, that that marble it was the one of my heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it sounds like to me that you will value the law more than anything. Okay. And if you value the law more than anything, it's written on your hearts. It do, and, and what comes out from that follows. Okay, well, let's read what it comes out from that. Um, the new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will um, put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord, because all will know me. From the least to the greatest, I will forgive their sins, and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, what is implied by those verses? It's the fulfillment of the law, actually. If we allow God to put his law within our hearts and thus recognize him as our God and recognize that thereby we become his people, isn't that God's ideal? Wouldn't that be our God's ideal? Say that again. If we allow him to do what he's talked about there in, in, in Jeremiah 31, put his law within our hearts and within our, within our minds, really is what we're talking about here, so that we, we actually understand what the law is all about and we want to do it, that's what's implied, then isn't that what God wants? And we want to do it. It's important to us. That kind of throws a monkey wrench into the theology. Some say that it's all done away with. We don't need to follow it. God is saying he's going to put it in our hearts. Okay. But don't you think it was, it always was in our hearts to some level? Because even before the Ten Commandments, the law was codified, we knew, people knew what it, uh, right and wrong. Sin existed. Mm -hmm. They may have, you know, didn't care, but they knew. But once the law came and acted as a mirror to show sin, God, they still did what they wanted to do, but God told them, I'm going to add it. It's going to be added to them until Jesus came. And Jesus came and fulfilled the law. We sh now we have uh, hope. And we spoke a lot about what the function of the law. The Ten Commandments is a freeing. It frees you. It, once you really absorb it, the things that say, don't do this, don't steal, don't lie, don't do it. Those things just become almost, it's, it's not easy, but it gets easier and easier, and it makes sense. Well, you don't, and you don't have to always worry about someone, you know, catching you and doing something you're not supposed to be doing. But most people don't care. Some people are sociopaths, they don't care. Yeah, you know, fair to say you become, that the, what we call the Ten Commandments 
are a description of the way one will conduct themselves if they're in harmony with the Creator. Yes. It's a guidance. Yeah, but why will they do that? Well, the, well, the tenth one says you won't even want to do it in, in, yeah, in, in essence. Why will that happen? Well, well it's a, by beholding you become changed, this was part of human nature. That, because you value it. That's right, yes. of that's course. That's the thing, you if value have no, it. Yes. And, and what does Jesus say? Where your treasure is, there will your heart. There your heart. Your heart will be also. But look at James 2, verse 8. You will be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom, which is found in the scripture. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do the right thing, right? Do you do that because somebody tells you to do it, or do you do it because... Well, that's the question. If we, if we could keep the whole law, we could be saved by keeping it. Of course, the poor problem is that we cannot. Remember that love is a fulfilling, fulfilling of all law. That's Romans, thir Romans 13, 8 and 10. Do we need a law to point out our sins? Would it be safe for God to take to heaven someone who observed every detail of the law? If you really understand understood the import of all ten, including the tenth one, would it be safe for, for God to admit you to heaven? Yeah, but you also, if you take that question too far, then you'll be like God. Mm, no. Because God is, because the law is the character of God. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we head towards. It's okay. something that's going to be head to, headed toward forever, for eternity. Aren't we going to head towards God to understand Him yes. more and more? Problem. Well, that's that's His character. That's keeping the law. Yeah, that's His character. Yeah. In the human condition, without Christ, pride gets tangled up in a lot of that. Where does that come from? Well, that's just where we're at. That's what makes it almost impossible well, to do on your own. We know historically that the Pharisees and the scribes multiplied detailed rules to try to force themselves and others to keep the law. But we know what the final result was. Those same Pharisees who proclaimed to high heaven that they were keeping the law, what, were they, what did they do to Jesus? They did their level best to kill him, to stop him to do whatever they could to get rid of him. Well, the word Torah in the Old Testament and namas in the New Testament mean direction or guidance. Those are the words that are translated law. They're words which, you, which were used to summarize all of God's instructions. Seventh-day Adventists, following the guidance of Ellen White, have said that the law is a transcript of God's character. That's what you were talking about a moment before. God requires perfection of his children. Is that easy? What do you mean by perfection there? Well, the biblical word perfection means maturity. It means growing up. That's so what how far do you grow up? No, 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 no. Well, That's not the question. That you said the question. You just gave me a definition there. How far do you grow up? No, I didn't talk about how far. I said perfection said is growing up. You, yeah, it's growing up. My question is, how far do you grow up before you're perfect? If you're not growing from now until the rest of eternity, you haven't grown enough. The whole point is, see, God is not going to save us on the basis of the fact that we've become perfect here and now. He's going to save us on the basis of the fact that we're working in that, well, I shouldn't say we're working, we're moving in that direction with God's help. Okay, you've just defined what perfect, what you mean by perfect right there. Yeah. When you just say perfect out of the blue, it's kind of, what are you talking about? Yeah. Let me read on. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law. And when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to, his God, to God's commands. Then the Lord can trust them, it's safe to save them, to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Christ Object Lessons, page 315. That's a very, very significant passage. Christ Object Lessons, again, page 315. And may I remind you that if you'd like to have these materials that we use in our study here, if you'd like to look at them yourself or even listen to this recording, 
You can find all of it at theox.org. That's T H E O X dot O R G. Welcome there. That's our website. Well, once again, we could look at, well, let's just look at a couple of verses. We already looked at Psalms 19, 7, and 8. Look at Romans 7, 12. So then the law itself is holy, and the commandment is holy, right, and good. So, I mean, how could we find any fault with something that's holy, right, and good? Well, look at what the Old Testament says. Once again, David, Psalm 119, 151, 152. But you are near to me, Lord, and all your commandments, all your commands are permanent. Long ago I learnt about your instructions. You made them to last forever. So, it's not something that's going away today or tomorrow. Then look at verse 172. I will sing about your law because your commandments are just or, or righteous. So the Bible writers describe the law as good, perfect, right, holy, permanent, or everlasting, and full of truth. How could you knock anything that was like, well, I, all those things? What could possibly be wrong with such a document? The law to a Jew meant, which to a Jew meant, that meant the five books of Moses, is full of instructions on morality, ethics, health, sexuality, diet, work, and many other things. In general, we have tended to divide God's instructions in the Old Testament into three categories. The ceremonial rules. What are ceremonial rules? What you did in the temple. What you did in connection with the tabernacle or the tent or, or later sacrifices. at the temple. This would be sacrifices and fulfilling all the requirements to, to have your sins removed, presumably. Two, civil regulations. What would those be? Don't kill. Don't kill? No stealing. When you need to do your business, take a little shovel and go outside the camp and dig a hole and bury it when you're done. I mean, that's a very, those are health rules, okay? And then there are moral laws. It is, al is it always clear to you which category each instruction from God belongs in? Is there any overlap between ceremonial rules and moral rules, civil rules? They all seem to point to love, though. We already read Exodus 23, and we noticed all the different instructions God gave there about treating your neighbors the way you should. In these verses, we are told not to be dishonest, not to lie, not to obstruct or pervert justice, not to take bribes, and not to mistreat foreigners. Would those be civil requirements or moral judgments, or both? Both. Yeah. yeah. Both. <laughs> both. Okay. When did God first give his laws to the human race? With Adam and Eve. Yeah. Did God need to tell Adam not to commit adultery? Well, there was no one else there to commit <laughs> adultery with, but he certainly told them about the Sabbath. Okay. We're told that Abraham commanded his household after him and instructed them in keeping the commandments, Genesis 26.5. There are many verses in the Bible before the time of Exodus that give us guidance in moral areas which later appear to have been incorporated into the Ten Commandments. Genesis 35, 1-4 is a story about removing idols. Judah says we need to get rid of all these idols. In connection with creation, God told us to rest on the Sabbath. We're all familiar with that, Genesis 1 and 2. When Cain killed Abel, God made it very clear that killing was not a good thing to do. Joseph refused to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife because it would be a sin against God. The ten sons of Jacob took the money which had been put in their sacks when they went home the first time back. They took it with them back to Egypt because they did not believe in stealing. Even Pharaoh rebuked Abraham for lying about his wife. So, I mean, those are a lot, a whole collection of the Ten Commandment principles and morals, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I have a yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Okay. Uh, he, he didn't want to com commit adultery. Joseph refused to commit adultery with... Uh, Out of his wife. Thank you. Because it, it would be a sin against God. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it a sin against God when the male patriarch in the Bible have sex with the slave to have children? You know, what have you? Well, that's, and that's a good question. That's a very good question because he thought by doing that, he was fulfilling what God wanted him to do. He thought. He was helping God out. 
And I remind you, in the New Testament, the Pharisees thought they were filling what God wanted them to do by killing Jesus. That just shows you how perverse our thinking can become. And God didn't make any condemnation of Abraham, what he did, and, and any of those, uh, but he let them suffer the consequences of, yeah. of, of their actions, yeah. okay? And yeah. that's a learning process. Is, maybe there's a reason why Jeremiah said the human heart is desperately wicked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, deceitful above all things. And yet God so loved the world. <laughs> well, do the regulations in the Ten Commandments make sense to you? Yes, they do. Yeah. If you are responsible for setting up the rules for a new community, brand new community, here you are, you're, you're going to, X number of people are going to be living in this community, and you're going to make rules for everybody to observe. Which one of the Ten Commandments would you be willing to leave out? I don't think it's possible yeah. to leave any of them out. <clears throat> if you understand human nature, the, or the finite mind in re relationship to the infinite, you couldn't leave any of them out. These, these commandments are not necessarily for God, they're for us. He gave them to us, they're a benefit to us. Mm -hmm. Well, they're a description of the way you will live for eternity. You are not going to be stealing, you're not going to be murdering, you're not going to have any other gods, and so on and so forth. What a world we and would have if, if everyone just followed those simple Ten Commandments. But see, people, they'll, they'll, they, most of them will accept, get to the point where they'll accept nine of them. Well, some of you will eight. remember, huh? some eight. Okay, so you include the tenth and the and the fourth. Okay, well, okay, but the uh, they have a problem with the with the f fourth in particular. Yeah. Okay. The fourth, which ironically seems to be the first. Well, the point going I'm trying all the to way make. Back to Adam and Eve. If human nature has to learn from the Creator, mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't born with all knowledge. You, you, the Creator has to uh, the Father. I'll teach you how to pray, our Father. So the parent has a duty to the kids, to teach the kids. He says, once a week, you know. Let's come together. Let's yeah. talk. Let's let's associate. Let's have fellowship together. Not 168 hours a week. Let's just remember, to 24. Let's not forget that one one time a week. Turn our hearts back. Of course, every day we should. Well, it becomes, but, it, but uh, one s Memorial Day. James two. Verse 11 says, for the, for the same one who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Even if you do not commit adultery, you have become a lawbreaker if you commit murder. Okay? So, um, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to go back up to the previous verse. Let's go back up here just a second. I want to look at verse 10. Uh, whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. Okay, should be verses ten and eleven. So now you got and all of them are all have that love uh, yeah. attachment to them. Yeah. If you break one of them, you've broken one of the love attachments. You've broken love, which breaks them all. But do you also see how it makes it even? Because you may have a problem with one, and I may have a problem with another one, and that person as well. So it makes everybody on an even play, playing field. But, but that's, that's really not the point, though. The point is, if you break one, you break them all. And they're all based on love. Mm -hmm. sure. And if one of them obliterates love, you've broken them all. Well, and if you've thought about it, yeah. you've broken it. Some, some people have tried to suggest that the, the law is like a chain. You break one link and the chain is basically useless, right? So it kind of seems like we, we need God. Because mm -hmm. even if you think it, which we should not do, you know, you've broken them all. Yeah. Well, a better suggestion, in my mind, might be something like this. If you were responsible for choosing who could be admitted to heaven, Suppose that, you know, we see these cartoons about St. Peter at the gate there. Okay, suppose you were in that position of St. Peter for a moment. If you were responsible for deciding who could be admitted to heaven, would you be happy to admit murderers? No, not if they were going to live next to me. <laughs> then live somebody, close to somebody else? Would you be happy to admit adulterers, liars, thieves, even those who are covetous or selfish? selfish? Wouldn't that just start the great controversy all over again? 
Wasn't that the problem back in the beginning? So God can't admit people who are breaking any one of these commandments because you just start the whole mess all over again, right? Well, actually, what you're saying is that those people aren't following God. Really now? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you follow God, you're following his character, so, which you're following the I, law. I come back to the verse we started with at the beginning. For our love for God means that we obey his commands. We just, we love him, we obey his commands, and his commands are not too hard for us. Right? Because we love him. Should be simple, right? I have a question mm -hmm. regarding thinking. As soon as you think some, about something, it's, it's you sin. Which one among us marry someone we, you know, disgust us? It was an attraction mm -hmm. that pulled us together. So when is it sin and when is it something else? Wow. Well, uh, let me take off of that. Is it obvious that keeping the commandments is an expression of our love for God? Yes. Didn't yes. Jesus say, John fourteen fifteen, if you love me, keep my commandments. There it is, just in blunt words, about as blunt as you can make it. Earlier, he had said that he was giving them a new commandment to love one another. And the, interest, the new part of that is what? To love one another as I have loved you. And in John 13, 35, he said, If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Is real Christian love so remarkable in our selfish world and so unusual that everybody notices? I think people can notice. Yes. Is that what Jesus was trying to say? Yes. Well, virtually all Christians will say that God's law is still binding on Christians. The exact role that the law is supposed to play is another matter. Romans 3, 19 and 20, which we looked at earlier, suggests that the law applies only to those under its authority. But then it goes on to say that the whole world will be brought into judgment. No one can be put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law does is to make people know that they have sinned. What's the function of the law? Bring us to God. Yes. By Pointing out our sin. teaching us when we stray away, right? It points out sin. Romans well, when 7 you sin, you're straying away. Yeah. Look at Romans 7 7 again. Shall we say then the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was a law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. This is Paul's comment, of course. When Paul first realized the implications of this verse, he was very upset. He thought that as a Pharisee, he could do all the things that all the little rules required and thus earn salvation. But the Tenth Commandment suggested that he could not even want to do anything wrong without sinning and made him angry. But then he realized that, uh, after some more careful thought, that that Tenth Commandment is what makes it safe to admit people to heaven. It will be safe to have people living next door to us in heaven not because they have the Ten Commandments posted on the wall, but because they have them in their hearts. We talked earlier about what it means to have it in their hearts. And they do not even want to do what is wrong. See, God is not going to have jails in heaven. He's not going to have police on every corner. He's only going to admit to, people in, to heaven people who don't even want to do anything wrong. Not just forgiven? Well, not just forgiven. What would it be like to live in a society where nobody even wanted to do anything wrong? You wouldn't have to lock your doors. Totally foreign. Yeah, I grew up fabulous. Totally foreign. Yeah. <laughs> well, I grew up in a, in, a, in, a, in a rural, small rural community in northern Idaho. We, the only time we had locked our door was when we went away for vacation. We probably didn't need to lock it then. I went to playing with Montana. People leave their cars running in the parking lot. Yeah. With the doors unlocked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, our world is awash in sin. 
It's on the freeway. It is advertised on billboards, on television, and on the internet. How can we possibly avoid it? Look at some of the results of what sin has done to our world. How has sin impacted even the lives of Christians? How has it impacted our own lives? I mean, none of us can say that we don't see every day sin basically being advertised. How do, what do we do in a situation like that? We have to keep close to the... Well, you, so, some of you remember, we've talked about this before, there was actually a group of Pharisees, a subgroup of the Pharisees, called the Bruised and Bleeding Pharisees. And these Bruised and Bleeding Pharisees had a very interesting situation. They believed, after they were married, you had to be, well, they were married, let's say. They believed that after you were married, it was a sin to look at anyone else's wife, or even any other woman who was not married, except your own. So they would wear complete veils as they walked down the street. And they would run into things and bruise themselves. And they believed that this bruising was a proof of their sanctity, their holiness, because they had not looked at any other woman. Who had the veil? They had the veil. The, yeah. the men? The men. The men. Oh, yeah. Because there's, there's other t praise parts of the world where they've got that fixed. They just drape their women so yeah. like a big tent, and yeah. so you can't see anything. Yeah. You're not even supposed to want to see anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, see, the, the tent takes care of that, so. Yes, okay. Well, most Christians will admit that nine of the Ten Commandments seem reasonable and logical. It's only the Sabbath commandment that seems to them to be ceremonial and no longer necessary. Are they saying, I want you to think about this for a moment, are they saying, how can we afford to give a whole day to God? Isn't that what they're basically saying? That would infringe upon them. It would infringe upon their right to you, work, earn money, shop. Go That's to church in the morning day. and watch the football game in the afternoon. <laughs> you know, though, works? I well, That's on Sunday if... The college is on Saturday, the Sabbath, so I see. you can I've watch the seen, professional games. I've seen some strict people on the Sabbath drive their kids crazy. Yes. Uh -huh. And so there is, they can make it so bad that that, that could keep people from doing it. Yes. Of course, Seventh-day Adventists have spent a lot of energy focusing on the fact that the Seventh-day Sabbath is God's only holy day. That is suggested by many verses in the Bible, starting with Genesis 1 and 2. There's no question about that. The Sabbath commandment in Exodus makes it very clear, Exodus 29 to 11. But it's interesting to notice that when the Sabbath commandment was given, was repeated in Deuteronomy 5, 15, what does it say? It gives a different reason for keeping it. In Exodus, we, instructed the, uh, we are instructed to keep the Sabbath because God created us. In Deuteronomy, the children of Israel were instructed to keep the Sabbath as a reminder of the fact that God redeemed them from Egyptian bondage. He created them, and he gave them freedom or recreated them as humans instead of slaves. So what is the main purpose of the Sabbath? Well, God calls it a sign. Now, we've talked about that before, signs, symbols. What's the, what's the, what's the purpose of a sign or a symbol? To point, to, to point to an idea, a concept, or something. It's a sign between us and him that we belong to him. The Sabbath is a sign between us and God that we belong to him. Exodus 31, 13. In many places, the Sabbath is described as a rest in the Bible. But as we look in the New Testament, we find that Jesus was frequently in conflict with the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem over Sabbath keeping. Look at John 5 and 9, just for example. Why was it that so often what is recorded about Jesus did involve Sabbath keeping and keeping it in a way other than what the Pharisees did? Was Jesus trying to tell us something about the Sabbath? Absolutely. And when he was crucified on Friday evening, he chose to rest in the grave over the Sabbath to add additional meanings to the Sabbath. Thus, the Sabbath is intended to remind us of all that God has done for us in the plan of salvation. But that is not all. 
if you read Isaiah 66, 23, maybe we should just take a moment to look at that. Isaiah 66, 23. On every, now this is, if you remember Isaiah 65 and 66, talk about what it's going to be like in the new earth. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. And when's that going to happen? That's the new earth, right? So the Sabbath is going to continue to exist right through eternity, right? Mm -hmm. we, Sorry. Go ahead. Psalms 111, I believe it's 7 through 8, says God's law, the Ten Commandments, stands fast forever and ever. There's no end to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Boy, that's going to be a lot, a lot of people in Jerusalem every Sabbath. Yeah. You get the whole universe there. Well... What do you think happens now when God says, I'd like to meet with all of you? Who do you suppose comes? Huh? Everyone. Everyone. What, is, what does Daniel 7 say? A hundred million. And that's just a start. I mean, that's probably the biggest number he could think of. So he just says a hundred million angels. When, when God calls the court to a session, a hundred million plus more. And when we look at the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, it seems everyone can fit. Yeah, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. And then if you add the spiritual dimension that perhaps our bodies will be changed into a spirit form or something, it's, it, it may seem like there's too much space out there. I don't know. I don't know. I, it's, it's symbolic, obviously, yeah. too. But um, I'm not quite sure <laughs> well, if it's a... If it's a festival like everybody, like traditionally it was mm -hmm. back then, mm -hmm. unless they're just talking about people on the earth. Well, national holidays and birthdays are our celebration of events that have happened in the past, giving us an opportunity to think back over them. So the Sabbath was intended to remind us of all the most significant things that God has done for us down through the generations. So what are those now? Creation. Redemption or from slavery in the case of, of Egypt. What's the next Salvation. one? Salvation, remembering what Christ did for us and why he rested in the grave after being crucified and all that that implies. And glorification, that's what we're going to do when we get to heaven. So four things, all that's supposed to be included in our worship on the Sabbath. How does the glorification fit? Well, we will continue to observe the Sabbath in the new earth. Isaiah 66, oh, just keep 23. Going. Yeah. Just keep going with it. Mm -hmm. It is also intended to, intended to remind us what God has promised will happen when we join him, as we said, in the future. Well, Genesis 1 and 2 make it clear that God wants us to keep the seventh-day Sabbath as a reminder of creation. Both Paul and John make it very clear that Jesus was the creator of all things. Colossians 1, 14 to 16, and John 1, uh, 1 to 14. And... If you believe that Paul wrote um, Hebrews, Hebrews 1 also. And also our Redeemer. He came to this earth to be Emmanuel or God with us, Matthew 1, 23. So we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 63, Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God can make atonement for its transgression. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. What does that mean? The law, the divine law, is as sacred as God himself. Therefore, what? None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law. Our best is like filthy rags, so God alone could do it. Okay. <laughs> We're told by Ellen White that back in the beginning when God suggested that Jesus would come down and give himself for man, the angels offered to come in his place. Why not? What would be wrong with that? They're created beings. And? The charges were against God, not about, not against the, the angels. Well, Satan's another charges thing, were against God. Another thing, though, the Son of God says I can lay my life down and bring it up again, and the angels couldn't. Yep. So it would be better if he did it than somebody else because the angel, if he laid themselves down, they couldn't come back up again. Yeah. So, one, it had to be Jesus because the questions were about God, 
about his character, about how he runs his government? What kind of questions have been raised about God and how he runs his government? Questions of fairness, mm -hmm. of truth. Of he wasn't willing to share his creative power. That question was answered right back in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? He made us male and female. I wonder if the, the Satan and the other angels had any concept about uh, creation. Mm -hmm. we, we don't uh, prior. I mean, prior to this creation of this earth, I mean, he didn't. Uh, uh, so by this verse, by by these words we just read from Patriarchs and Prophets, page sixty-three, is God trying to tell us it needed a huge price to pay for our salvation? Is that what he's trying to say? Or is he trying to tell us that since the questions and accusations that Satan has leveled against God in the great controversy need to be answered by God himself, only God can demonstrate the truth about himself. Well, when you keep the Sabbath carefully, do you feel a little bit like a legalist? Well, you're, you're joining God mm -hmm. in his Sabbath. It's his Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It's not our Sabbath. Um, it was his seventh day. It wasn't our seventh day. It was our second day. That's, well, right? Yeah, that, but still, it's his Sabbath. Yeah. It even says in the commandments that you uh, remember my Sabbath mm -hmm. and keep it holy. Mm -hmm. So, define carefully because yeah. the Pharisees have had an idea. What they had hundreds of rules. If you did something, if you carried a burden during the week on this side of your hand, you had to carry it on the back side of your hand on Sabbath. If you had a runny nose, you would have to have your, and you needed a handkerchief, it, it, you couldn't carry a handkerchief, that's a burden. So you'd have to have it maybe pinned or sewed onto your clothes so that you could use it like this because you can't carry it on the Sabbath. And I could go on and on. Reminds me of those old uh, vaudeville or other guys who had the drum and the trumpet and, and all the instruments and they'd go down the street with everything <laughs> banging and... <laughs> Okay. Well, a lot of, a lot of uh, apparatus there. Yeah. I think the Sabbath is like God inviting us into His home. Okay. You know, it's not exactly. You know, how do we keep the Sabbath? Well, we just go in and as a guest to mm -hmm. watch Him or be with Him as He keeps His Sabbath. What do you think? How do you think we'll keep the Sabbath in heaven? Discussion. Discussion of what? Oh, great controversy could be one thing. Could be honoring, worshiping, praising mm -hmm. the Lord. Is that what we're the way be he doing does every things? day? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but he's going to take there's, me up to. There's going to be something special. Special I've things. I've, I've <laughs> often wondered whether we have any real concept of heaven until we get there. I yeah. agree. Let, let me make a suggestion, just to think about. Might we come together on <laughs> Sabbath, and God would say, "Hey, what have you been doing this week?" Oh, I discovered this and this and this, and I saw some beautiful things. And God says, you know what? That's wonderful. Next week, why don't you try this and this and this and see what happens? And it's even better. I think every Sabbath is going to be one joyous occasion. We're going to say, man, I was so excited. I got to see this and this. It was so beautiful. And God says, okay, let's try it next week. Try this, try this, try that. I can hardly wait. Well, we know that Satan has been very successful in attacking Sabbath observance. Why do you think Satan has done everything possible to convince people that the Sabbath does not need to be observed anymore? If you can get rid of the Sabbath, you throw God out the window. It's do you, do you, you know, do you look forward to the coming of the Sabbath more than to its conclusion? What would happen if we could live in a community here on this earth where everyone had God's law firmly written in his heart. And you remember our verses from Jeremiah 31. A parent of a freshman medical student told me within the last few days that his son, who's studying all week very diligently, said he was so grateful when Friday night came because now he doesn't have to study. Okay. So Is that the purpose that, that, that's, of the Sabbath law? No, that's Rest. one person who looked forward to the Sabbath. Okay. God desperately wants to develop a group of friends here on this earth who understand him and have come to know him well and on that basis choose voluntarily 
to do all that he asked them to do because they recognize that God would never ask them to do anything which is not for their own good. Do you ever feel that God's laws and rules are somehow a restriction of your freedom? Many Christian martyrs down through the centuries have died for one thing or another. You know, maybe you've read Fox's Book of Martyrs. What Christian beliefs are so important to you that you'd be willing to die rather than give them up? Could you make a list? These things I'm so convinced. Remember, Galatians 1, Paul said what? If anyone comes with a different gospel, a gospel different than the one I preached to you, may he go to hell. And then he repeats it. Paul was absolutely convinced of the truth of his version of the gospel. Can we be that convinced? And if we're that convinced, would we go the next step and say, okay, I would rather die than give that up? Paul, that's what Paul did. He said, I'd rather die and to give up what I believe about the gospel. Because in essence, you will live. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, would you be willing to die rather than give up the Sabbath? You think it's going to come to that? Well, don't we believe that the day is coming when Satan, through his evangelistic effort, as described in Revelation 13, will manage to bring about first a national Sunday law, and then an international Sunday law. That's what Ellen White says. But why does he do that? Why do you think he does that? Other countries already have. I asked you. <laughs> People are losing their lives right now as we're sitting here over this kind of thing. Yeah, there are major areas in India that so many people are becoming Christians and, and, and Seventh-day Adventists, many, millions of them, literally, that the, the, the local governments are trying to make it against the law to change yeah. To change religions. And what happens when they do that? More. More people are baptized and become Christians. The blood of the martyrs, the seed of the church, right? Well, could we end up in prison because of Sabbath observance? Are we prepared to do that? Think about that. That's your question for this Sabbath. Would you be willing to die for the Sabbath? Or even go to prison? Think about it this next week. We'll see you next week.